virtually. Right, and we're streaming live now. Good evening, everyone. This is the Human Resources Committee for East Hearts Cairns District Council on the 5th of August 2020. We are streaming this on live because of the coronavirus situation. Um, we uh, will start the agenda item um, with number one for apologies. Um, I know we, we have a full house, so no apologies, or do I do it as something otherwise? No, no apologies. So no we're apologies. To Lovely to see you. No. Lovely to see everyone. If everyone can stay on mute, please, it will mean there's less interference in the recording. Um, when we need to vote, uh, we will be putting, because there are so few of us, we'll be putting our hands up against the screen to see the vote. Um, thank you very much. We're on to number item number two, which is the minutes from the 12th of February. Everyone will have received the uh, documentation a week in advance. I'm assuming everyone has read them. Have we got any comments on the minutes, please? Anyone have any comments to make? Then those are received. Thank you. Um, Sorry, Chair, item I'll... number three Sorry, is Councillor the Alder, just announcement. Yes. Sorry, Councillor Alder. Councillor um, Alder. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it, it's just um, on the. Uh, I'm happy to propose the acceptance of the minutes, which is what you will need. But Thank in you. doing so, I just wanted to raise one question, nothing to do with the accuracy of the minutes at all, but it's to do with the item on loan working, which is on page nine. Uh, now that so many of our staff, in fact, all the staff are home working, are we confident that they are all fully supported uh, by um, the HR department because they um, ones who originally were home workers had a device. Are we sure? Are we sure that all the people currently now have a device? Should they require help? Um, I just like a little bit of clarification on that, and perhaps uh, uh, Simon would be able to just reassure me on that point. I can certainly reassure, reassure you, Councillor Alder, and I would refer you to the the final paper in terms of the HR and payroll team update, which covers all of the work that we've done and talks about IT equipment being provided and the wellbeing survey and the positive results that we've received in that, which confirms that staff are fully supported working from home and any issues that they have are taken on board and are supported as well. Sorry, Chair, just to the point of order, I don't, I don't mean to cut across anybody, but just on those items, we just need to be confirming the accuracy of the minutes and that everyone's happy with them rather than picking up items from that. So. We can obviously return to questions later, but if we could just stick to the minutes and, and you know, approving them as a correct. Um, you're proposing the minutes. How do we have a seconder, please? Happy to second. Oh, second. I propose that they be accepted in the first place. Thanks. Thank you. And Councillor Ruffles, you, you got in there first, I think, for seconding it. Thank you. Can we have votes in favour? All those in favour of voting? Thank you. Right, that's carried. Um, agenda item number three, Chairman's announcements. I don't have much to say really, except to say how impressed I have been with how well the officers um, have handled the difficult time. Um, it's, it's, been, it's been very difficult for everyone, all the staff with their remote working. Um, and there's an awful lot of work gone in. The um, HR department have have found their workload increased exponentially, um, uh, but yet they have managed to cover everything um, in a friendly, efficient, capable way um, and of supporting members and ensuring they are supported by other people. Um, they, you will see from the final report that the wellbeing survey was sent out and they're ensuring that um, those in crisis or those not in crisis are being supported. Um, and I'm, I'm very impressed with all the work, so I just wanted that minuted, really, how, how well they have done. So thank you very much to the, to the whole team. Um, moving on to item number four, declarations of interest. 
Do we have any new members? Councillor Ruffle. Well, uh, Chairman, uh, the big item at the end, uh, item 17, I think, uh, does refer to uh, the HR services to external organisations. And I'm a member of Harford Town Council, which has been a recipient of uh, that work, and it is mentioned in the minutes. And although it's not a DPI, I would like it noted that I have that connection with a business link between the two councils. Thank you. Well, as do Councillor Newton and I, and I, I know that we have um, we have made this declaration earlier. I don't know, Peter, if we need to make it at every meeting or not. Or will, whoever, will, sorry. Peter, do you want to take that? No, it doesn't necessarily declare it at every meeting. It depends on the circumstances. Right, but it's noted. Thank you very much, Councillor yeah. Russell. Any other declarations of interest? Right, moving on to agenda number item five, which is page 15, the um, local joint panel minutes. Uh, there are two lots from the 5th and the 1st of July. Everyone should have had opportunity to read those. Right. Have we got any comments, anyone? Yes, Councillor Alder. Thank you, Chairman. Um, page 18, I think it is, um, the East Hearts Together Development uh, Group, uh, do they have terms of reference? And I wonder if I could have a little bit of an explanation as to what they do, uh, because I'm not on the local panel, so I, I wouldn't have heard what was said. There's a My Colab telephone system uh, could I have a bit of background to the group for forming of the group, please? Again, Councillor Alder, I would refer you in particular to the HR and payroll team update, which talks quite extensively about East Hearts Together and includes reference to the one page plan, which sets out what the group is about and what the aims are. But in summary, East Hearts Together is a is part of the corporate, the new corporate plan. So the new corporate plan is SEED, which is the sustainability, the engagement and the economic development and the digital side. But underpinning all of that is the East Hearts Together programme, which is about improving the resources and the tools available to both staff and managers to help us deliver those corporate priorities. So the example that you gave there of my collab was actually that we want to make the use of my collab more efficient so staff can really reap the rewards of having things like online chat, um, being able to know where people are because the my collab will follow them, for example, or indeed the my collab will tell them that someone is working from home or is on a, on a break, etc. It links in with your Outlook calendar. So these are all tools to improve the way staff effectively deliver their, their roles. Um, and East Hearts Together is working on a program um, which will develop a HR strategy for this meeting, which I've said well, I'll bring to the next meeting. Um, uh, but it also it will be the driver of developing our policies and procedures. But it's very much a cross service group, as with all of the seed groups, um, which means that we are pulling across the organisation to work together. So it's not a HR only group, um, although HR obviously quite dominant in the group. Jackie, in fact, uh, I know she's observing is part of the group and, uh, and in fact uh, offered to join in with that. It's been very much any member of staff can join the group and Jackie was one of those people that wanted to join the group. But we've got coverage from each service area and uh, fundamentally we've been establishing some housekeeping uh, rules uh, recently. So that's meant that we've got people having their photos on the intranet, on Outlook, which is obviously much better for everyone concerned. Equally, we've been looking at Zoom protocols. We've been, in fact, Jackie's been leading on the voicemail protocol as well. So it's basically trying to get our staff more consistent and to use the tools that we have available to us consistently, but more importantly, to get them fully effective because we've got pockets of good use, but it's not consistent. So East Hearts Together, hence the name Together, is about pulling us all together so that we all work better together to produce better results together. And there's a real danger I'll say together too many times, so I'm going to stop now. Thank you. Councillor Dumont? I was going to say, Chairman, I think Peter Ruffles left. I don't know if you saw that. No, he's, he's oh, back. Sorry, he's, he's, oh, he's, he's back. Okay. My apologies. Did, did you have a question, Councillor Dumont, or was it just... No, sorry, I was just, I was just um, advising you, Chairman, that I think Peter Ruffles yeah. had left. I don't know if we needed to pause when he came back in, but he's back now. 
Councillor Ruffles, do you need any? Do you need anything repeating? You're muted. So um, will these um, two lots of um, minutes, they just they need resolving. We don't need to vote on these, do we? Just receive them, yeah. Just receiving both. So receiving both the, do we need to vote on that or not? No vote needed on that. No, thank you. Right, we'll move on to item six on the agenda, which is the, um, the health and safety committee, the safety committee meeting which is on page 29. Right, any questions, comments, observations? Uh, Councillor Ruffles. Chairman, um, 3.5 uh, refers to car park extensions uh, that have been planned uh, and the loss of trees. As a Harford member, that's a particularly sensitive matter for us, the tree loss. But I, and I know it's not for debate here, but I wondered where we were with the proposals to um, develop the car parking area, which would have involved that loss of trees. Uh, it, the trees haven't been removed. Um, it hasn't been progressed. I, th I think the trees were actually under a tree preservation order, so yes. um, it hasn't been it hasn't been progressed, Peter. And it wouldn't be if there was a preservation. Um, that that meeting obviously was way back in January. What yeah. we are still constantly yeah. trying to look for is ways of increasing the car park. Of course, this was all before COVID nineteen, where we are now looking much more at a hybrid model yeah. of more working yeah. from home and therefore less use of our car park and less use of emissions on the road, etc. In line with sustainability. So I think it's slightly old news, but um, I obviously appreciate the, the the question. And yeah, I can tell you that no trees have been removed. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Councillor Alder. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, I, I was going to raise this as well, but uh, it, my understanding was that the there was they were looking at increasing the uh, disabled car parking in the public area, whereas I thought the other related to increasing staffing uh, at the at the rear. Um, could you just clarify that for me? Because um, I think it would be a good thing to have a bit more disabled parking in the public area thank yeah, you i can't comment on the spaces in the public area it would be inappropriate for me to do so i don't have any knowledge on plans or um, obviously this was in relation to staffing and and the difficulty of staff having parking spaces that this matter came up as health and safety because it was actually in part because some additional spaces were added for the caretaker but this is really getting very operational if I get into it too much. So from, from a high level point of view, I can't comment on the uh, public spaces and the increasing of disabled spaces. I know that we are equally looking at whether we can add more disabled spaces into the staff car park, but that's in relation to staff need, which obviously we, we would need to address. Um, uh, we currently have a rotor system on our own disabled spaces. Um, we don't, um, the disabled spaces in the public area are not used by staff and are obviously kept for members of the public. So beyond that, I can't really comment any further, I'm afraid. Yeah, and Chair, just sorry to labour the point, but um, we're just receiving the minutes here. If, if we are just got questions, the and yeah. can we do that outside of the meeting? Thank you. Thank you. Um, right, I'm moving on to the, um, just having a wobbly, on to the next agenda item, agenda item number seven which is the Human Resources Committee from the, oh, hold on, where are we? It's the, um, the council report. So who is talking to this one? Is this, is this you, Simon? Yes. We're on page. Sorry, 33. apologies. I'm just, just getting to the paper myself. I do apologize. Um, yeah. I believe this is Vicky that will be covering this paper. Am I right, Vicky? If we're talking to the HR quarterly stats now, are we on to those, Alvis? Item seven is the is the uh, quarter four report, um, which we obviously, I'll start at the beginning on this because we circulated this. Can we have the page number, Chairman? Page 33. So yeah, this is the HR uh, management statistics from quarter four. These, this paper, you may recall uh, members of the committee that we sent yeah. this to you at the time that it was written because of the meeting being postponed. So it is very much an information paper. 
Um, I would probably propose that rather than go through any of it, I'll take if there's any questions, because again, it is slightly out of date now. We have got a quarter one report to look at, which is obviously more up to date. And equally, we have an annual report that covers all four quarters from the previous year. So it may be better to focus yeah. more on the annual report. I wanted to ensure this was received at this meeting because it hasn't been formally received. But to a large extent, this was three months ago that we provided this. I'm happy to receive Thank you. Right, that Can I ask a question? Can I ask a question? Well, we are we just receiving this then, oh. Will? Or yes, um, I, we can take questions on this item. Today we are. Thank you. Go on, Councillor Demont. Thank you. Just, just briefly, uh, Simon, on page forty-two. Yeah. Um, three point six. It sort of goes over forty-one, forty-two, where we talks about. Uh, targets or diversity and inclusion targets where do the target numbers come from I think is this very national good. statistics or, or is a it very, it very good question uh, the targets have evolved from the census data from 2011 that's my understanding they were set sometime before me but i've equally asked the same question councillor demont and um, been told that they were born out of the census data because this is obviously the thing of trying to ensure that the organization you have reflects the community that you serve so that's where those targets have come from obviously that is also equally worth noting that those those that those target numbers are considerably out of date in terms of the census being 10 years old um um, and we have actually discussed at leadership team looking for revised up to date, um, not census data, but local data on the diversity profile and adjusting those targets in line with that. So that's a piece of work to come in due course. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Alder. Thank you, Chairman. Um, it was on 3.4, uh, the learning and development. Uh, I'm really impressed with all the courses that are offered. But I wondered whether any had been offered to the parish, the parish councils in East Hearts, because you did agree that you would offer if there were spare places. Um, I just wondered whether there had been any uptake or whether yeah. they'd been offered at all. Yeah, um, I've reviewed the matter with Helen Farrell, who obviously leads on our or, on our training and development side. Or she's joining in for this one, it looks like. But um, if I just start to start to answer it, say that Helen always uh, sends out the training information to our various parish councils and our town councils. I will also be honest enough to say to you that the response from parish councils is at best patchy. Um, often the contact details have changed, um, so it's quite a difficult task for us. But as you will note again in the team report, we are looking to develop relations further with all the parish councils, both in terms of potential for HR services based on the Dutchworth experience, but equally for training courses as well. And then that will actually include Helen maybe going a step further and, and offering them a training needs analysis if that's something they want to buy. Obviously, we're not going to give this away for free. Um, but if people um, want, and equally with the course spaces, we've just done that as a cost recovery measure. So we will work what the total cost of the course is and we'll divide it by the number of people on it and then sell a space on that basis. So um, yes, they are offered to parish councils. It hasn't always been easy to get the message to them because sometimes they've changed their contact details without telling us. So I know that's something that Helen um, has to keep on top of and it isn't an easy task. Is there anything you want to add, Helen? Um, just that after the last HRC when it was raised, we did we've have got a list of the courses that um, sorry a list of contact link, um, contact numbers for parish and town councils. So that will be something that we will be really pushing in the future. We had some really good responses with our town councils when we did the uh, managing aggressive customers training, and also we've got lots of inquiries that matter about the e-learning as well. So it's in development, and then hopefully now we've got the right contact details, we can contact the right people, and we can continue to develop that. Thank you, Helen. Councillor Alder. Um, it, it, uh, just to say that I think it's an opportunity for members themselves to uh, actually. Um, make contact with their pa local parishes to uh, reinforce the fact that these are offered sometimes and that, uh, you know, they should take advantage of them because I think it's very generous of the council to offer them to parishes. Um, and it's a great pity if the parishes themselves are not availing themselves of the offer, but uh, it's just something that members themselves could do. Can I just thank say you. thank you, Councillor Alder, that um, would be really helpful if members wish to encourage their local parish councils. And as I say, um, what we are 
now you know moving towards is is not just uh, selling spaces on our course which are very economically um valuable to them because yes you would never get a, an individual on a course for 35 pounds for example which is the sort of figures we're talking about but um equally we are also keen to offer more uh, on a pay-as-you-go basis like we do with Hartford Town Council or the HR services because obviously that means we can again give them a, a very good valued product but um, um, stop them putting money into sort of private consultancies that can make lots of money and we can give them a, a high class service with a, a local authority knowledge that they won't get from elsewhere and in, indeed as the paper refers to at the end um, we've been approached now by Ware Town Council for that very reason we didn't actually go looking for the business they've come to us Datchworth have come to us but we want Want to flip that around now and actually make some phone calls out but we're, we're still working on the offer yeah. and obviously we want to then when the offer's clear which i need to get clear for where town council anyway we will be looking at that thank you any other questions can we move on to it we're noting this report aren't we do i need a proposer for this no you just need to know this no we're just noting this report thank you very much um now we're moving on to the next item which is the item number eight, the health and safety quarterly review. And this is the quarterly review, and then it's going to be followed by the annual report, uh, which is item number nine. And just for so, clarity, Chair, this is again a quarter four report, so I don't know if you want to treat four. it in the same way. Yeah, the, the annual report obviously is more comprehensive. Um, do we have any questions? Or any points on the um, on the quarterly report before we move on to the annual one? Can we already... No, this is a, this is to be noted. This report, isn't it? So we'll move oh, on correct, to our, um, number. Sorry, did I miss someone? Sorry, I was just confirming that's correct, Chair. Thank you. And we're on to agenda no, item number nine, health and safety, the annual report. So thank you very much, Peter, for being here. Um, questions on the report, please. It's very comprehensive, um, awful lot of detail in it. Um, Peter, we've read it all. Did you have anything to add before we go to questions or not? Or are you just happy to answer the questions? I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, thank you. Councillor Demand. Um, hello there, I'm on page uh, 7879. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can, sorry. Cool. Yeah, page 7879, um, where it talks about reopening and, and coming sorry, out of COVID. I, I thought the report went up to page 72. Have we gone on to the next one? Oh, I have jumped on to the... Yeah, you're correct, Councillor Newton. Okay. Yeah, I've gone on to the... We're on the, the annual next. report, which is on page 57, isn't it, I think? Yeah, sorry, and I've jumped on 70. to the, 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 the following quarter review, so I can save the question to them. It will be Peter answering it, if that helps, Joseph. <laughs> Councillor Demont looks like he's frozen on my screen. I promise you, I'm 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 still not okay. frozen. <laughs> right, Have, are you asking a question? Well, it was I, I jumped on. Sorry, I I looked at the wrong report. I'm looking at the the following quarter's report. Okay. Of a, April to June. Right. So we're on the annual report at the moment. Have we got any questions on that? A lot of really good points in here. I was very impressed. Any questions? No, I'm going to say there are a lot of very positive things. Um, if I could say, Madam Chairman, yes, it, it always amazes me the amount of work all these reports do. It, it is quite phenomenal, I have to say. Okay. It, it seems really like every single T and dot is across and uh, I is dotted. So um, well done. I mean, it, it is some of it. Yeah. I mean, I don't know what's happening now. <laughs> That's another question. But, but so far, I was very impressed. Yeah. 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 It, 
if, if I might, Chair, just make one comment on, yeah. just because I'd like to just remind members that this is actually a brand new report for you, the annual report. This is something yeah. that me and Peter have developed. Um, so, you know, what you will note, particularly in the report, and we have been disappointed by this, um, is we haven't managed to get a, a benchmark to compare our results to. We've obviously made yeah. comparison to a previous year, which is an improvement as well. Um, and as the report highlights, myself and Peter are working for our own networks to see if we can get some more data um, so that we can make some comparisons. But obviously the big headline in terms of an annual health and safety report is, is business as usual. There's been improvements in particular, the annual risk assessment program is now much better addressed and that's fully up to date. As you may recall, we had a health and safety audit that highlighted some concern with that. That's now been fully addressed. So particularly grateful for Peter for making sure that's all been gathered. And, and we've joined up the whole of health and safety much more to leadership team, which means that they get sight of this report early on. And obviously they know it's coming to you guys. So the, the carrot and stick is in full play. We're getting all of our annual risk assessments done and the visibility is increased. And as I say, we will work on developing that benchmarking, hopefully for next, well, not hopefully, but we will work on developing it for the next annual report so that members can see how we compare to other organisations. That will always be a challenge because, of course, it depends on what your organisation's doing. And in particular, Stevenage having all of their services not contracted out in terms of waste, et cetera, will have higher degrees of accidents and, and so forth as a result of that. Having said that, we also monitor our contractor performance and, and that's obviously all shown in the report as well. So. Um, yeah, I would equally like to thank Peter for the effort that he's put into this. And this is obviously his his first annual report. And um, yeah, we're quite happy to take comments on email after the meeting if anyone wants to, in terms of maybe more that you'd like to see or less that you'd like to see, because this is the first report. But appreciate if there's no questions, I'll stop now. It is an excellent report. Thank you, Peter, very much. And as you say, it's very disappointing. Was it only seven authorities have responded? Yeah. So, um, yeah, that, that is disappointing, but a lot of hard work going into it. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, so we're just noting that report. We're not doing need to vote on that, do we? No, no. So we're moving on to agenda item number 10, which is the next quarterly uh, report for the health and safety. This is on page 73. Councillor Dumont, you definitely had a question on this one, didn't you? <laughs> I'll try again. I'll try again. So it was um, the bottom of page 78, um, right. 6.2, where we're talking about, or where you're talking about, uh, reopening of things as we come out of lockdown. Um, and when it talks about Warfields, obviously it says the eventual reopening when there's government guidelines. I don't know, is this Warfields doesn't have a date on it? A few offices and or offices are starting to open up now. Is there any indication of when we might see people back there? on a, even a limited basis, or, or is that still a straightforward no at the moment? We have members of staff who are now going into the offices, and um, based on the available desk space, given the account of social distancing, um, we have a, a rounded figure of, um, I think, 132, 132 um, members of staff who can be uh, accommodated safely on a two meter um, social distance basis or 160 with a one meter yeah uh, given that some of our corridors are, are narrow and and ensuring that we have a free flow of stuff we're also monitoring that number on a daily basis to ensure that we stay within um tolerance for first aid cover fire safety um so our corporate property manager has been in the building since lockdown to sort of oversee the background operations and so I liaise with him I myself have been into the office to see that we have got compliance and no one is there who should not be there um, my colleagues are looking at the annual at, at the well-being survey and where people have identified significant problems we'll be working with them um, but yes, uh, we do have staff going in. Um, we have a protocol for entry and exit. We have now also reopened the council chamber for a maximum of 23 people to attend meetings, but not uh, involving the public at this stage due to the, the risk of uh, transmission. Just to say, I think, I think we've slightly confused you, so I do apologise, Councillor Dumont. <laughs> when, when we talked about the eventual reopening in, in the paper, what we really meant was to the public. The, the offices have remained open throughout the period. 
We initially had a maximum of about five staff uh, on any given day. The average number now is 30 based on us moving to, uh, we developed the office. All of the work that is listed there has been done. That, you know, that was us reporting that it's been done. So, um, and, and in, in fact, myself and Jackie, in terms of union involvement, U Unison have been involved in all of the risk assessments, first of all, but myself and Jackie arranged a meet where we went and did a walk around the whole building to make sure we were happy with all the measures that have been put in place. Because obviously one can design it from one's desk, but you want to see it working in operation and make sure it's being followed. So yeah, it's been a, it's been a well joined up process. And I thank, uh, as, as she's here, I better say it. Um, I thank Jackie for her support from Unison in making sure we've, we've done all that. I, I've thanked her outside of this, Meeting to be clear, but <laughs> yeah, she's listening. In <laughs> okay, and just just a follow up question. Yeah, just a just a, a very quick follow up, and it's tricky because as, as other members have pointed out, and as I've pointed out at full council before, these are excellent reports and they're very extensive, and there's a lot of it. So yeah. I want to make sure I'm asking the right question in the right yeah. place. Um, but I, I would hope that it goes without saying that as lockdown eases, as more and more people go back, that those who who are especially vulnerable, who have been shielding underlying health conditions, I'm guessing they will have um, even more support, um, partial support and, and occupational health support. Um, that uh, particularly those who have concerns and who are further at risk will have more support than others as we all start to go back to offices. Yes, would that be ab correct? Absolutely. Um, the HR officers will be working closely with their respective teams and those members of our staff who do have um, higher need or concerns, they'll be working very closely with them uh, on our, through our wellbeing hub, but also on a face-to-face -face basis. So absolutely critical that, that we look after everybody coming back in. And that we're just, to carry on. Just to add to that, Peter, because uh, I just want to make sure members are absolutely clear. Um, the wellbeing survey results, which have been included as an appendix to the team report, so you may not have seen them, but they've also been published on our intranet. One of the questions that we asked was around shielding and not just shielding for yourself, but also members of your household shielding. So we've taken stock of the whole picture. And one of the key questions we actually asked, because members might be surprised to hear this, but if we insisted on someone shielding working from home, we could they could claim discrimination on the basis of disability, potentially, that we're treating them less favourably than others by not allowing them to come back into the office. But the current state of play for all staff, essentially, is no one is being forced into the office. We are supporting people that want to return to return at this stage in, in this, the fundamental message. And obviously some jobs have involved the need to be in the office and those staff are quite happy to be in there because of the COVID secure measures we've put in place. In particular with shielding staff, uh, the vast majority of those are still remaining working from home unless they've asked to come back in. And indeed, as I say, the question, one of the questions we asked wasn't just do you need to shield, but do you wish to carry on shielding beyond the government guidance? Because obviously that also ended on the 1st of August for a number of people. But we, we are very much in the basis of keeping staff numbers minimal at this stage. We are supporting the wider measure of not trying to create a second uh, wave as such. Um, and when we do allow more staff to go back into the office, which you know is down really to staff wanting to go back in more in the main, we will have to look at a team A and B approach so that there, if there is then a transmission issue in the workplace, which is the whole danger of having lots of people in the workplace. It all sounds great until and we've had scenarios with staff with symptoms and then we've had to get staff to stay off the, out of the building, then we've had to get testing done, etc. It's a big process and one that we are not rushing to encourage lots of. So by keeping people working from home, we're protecting all of our staff, not just the, the shielding staff or indeed some of the people just below that bracket that are known as clinically vulnerable, I believe. But we've clarified all of those details. Every single member of staff has effectively either completed the survey or has had a follow up with their line manager. And the results are very, very positive and staff are very happy with the support that they're getting. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any other questions on this report? Oh, Councillor Ball. Can you hear me, Chairman? We can, yes. Um, yeah, uh, just a small point, just a comment. Uh, I think I'm on the right wide link. Bundyford Service Centre, the Waste Centre. Um, yes. We're on that, aren't we? Yes? Yes, we are. Yeah, yes. Um, I was rather surprised to hear or read in the report that there was a small fire. Um, I'm rather surprised that it was a household battery. Because, well, I mean, they, they scan through most of that waste and that is a, a, a fairly big uh, outfit there. 
and they yeah. do deal with a lot of paper. So I was rather surprised that it got through the net, this household battery. Well, the theory is that, that that's what the waste services contractor, Abasa, believe. It was a, a battery that the um, tipper vehicle, the, 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 the dump truck, forks as it went under to, to the load, um, caught the battery. What Abasa has stated is that during the lockdown, there has been more uh, waste put into general waste bins rather than either recycled because people haven't been able to go to recycling centres because they've been closed. So they have been taking extra care, but obviously with the volume of waste that's going into the tipping hall, it's not feasible for them to run through every load. Um, it was a very caught very quickly, I have to say. Um, and we had recently installed additional firefighting measures in the tipping hall, uh, which were used and the incident was recorded and monitored. So it was an unfortunate uh, incident, but a batter believe purely from the fact that uh, lockdown has forced people to Re not recycle and put ordinary, uh, you know, recyclable waste into their ordinary bin. Um, so their theory is that they believe it was a household battery, um, given how quickly it happened. Um, so that's, you know, without uh, knowing exactly what it was, that, that's the theory that it was a, a battery, but yeah. Right, thank you. Thanks for that uh, um, remark. Anyway, thank you, I accept that. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Peter. That's really good. That's very um, comprehensive answers. Uh, any other comments or questions on this report before we move on to noting it? No. In that case, we're just noting this report as well, aren't we, officers, I think? Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, and our agenda item number 11, the learning and development review. So, so this will be Helen taking his paper, but just before Helen starts, um, Peter, you've got through your three health and safety papers now. So Peter is going to leave us, um, unless anyone has any last questions for him before he goes. Um, but yeah, he's covered the health and safety papers, which was what I asked him Thank to do you. at this meeting. Pete, Thank you. Peter, the, Peter, there was a lot of paperwork, well, documentation there. Thank you very much for all your hard work. Thank well, you, uh, continuing throughout the whole year, it's, it's, it's unrelenting, isn't it? But we appreciate all your efforts. Thank you very much. And it's good Thank, to you, Peter. Thank, Thank you, you, Peter. Have a good Thanks, evening. Thanks, Peter. Bye. Bye. Right. OK, so Helen, um, it's a good report. Thank you very much. Is there anything you want to add before we move on to questions or not? Um, the only thing I would add is that I didn't have the figures at the time, but we did the election training for um, our polling clerks and presiding officers. And yeah. the figure that came back was that we trained 158 people. That's the only addition to the report because I didn't have that information at the time of the report. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Newton, you have a question. Um, just a quick one. Um, Budget-wise, were you a little bit over recently? Um, the three budgets that we managed for health and safety were um, underspent. There was one of the training and development budgets in one of the services was overspent. Mm -hmm. um, and because of that, then that made the whole training budget across the board be overspent. But the positive that's come out of that is that actually there's going to be some more investment, which gives us more money for training and development. Okay. Um, we were predicted to be overspent in the professional training budget, um, but one of our members of staff was doing a degree and I managed to get that funded through the apprenticeship levy. So that actually saved us £9,000 in the actual um, professional training budget. So actually, you know, we managed to train somebody else and that didn't actually have a major impact on our budget. Well done. Just echo that and um, when Helen's we manage three budgets one of them's health and safety the other two are professional training and corporate training Helen manages all of them and she's managed them to the point where they are underspent this year um not sure if we're totally convinced at leadership team that it was the right thing to reward the local services by giving them an extra 12,000 but I'll keep working on whether we can get that back into the central pot where we get far greater economies of scale so um but the budgets have been well managed is the message you should hear from certainly a HR point of view 
and Thank obviously you. in the local areas they have the option to buy money between budgets as well so that, that you know the overspend wasn't an overall overspend it was within the training pot precisely okay yeah appreciate the clarification thank you thank you any other questions or comments councillor demand thank you chairman um simon i think you on page 91 um where we talk about apprentices um i forget or i'm, I'm not sure if they're delivered in-house or if there's an external firm used but what, what's the sort of level or extent of disruption to these qualifications because of lockdown or, or have they continued at at just Helen leads on our apprenticeship, so I'm going to let Helen answer it. I'll add if needed. My apologies. Thank you. It's okay. Um, we um, had nine apprentices last year, and all of them have continued. Um, to be fair, I've just done um, uh, an article that's going out in our um, Connect magazine, because two of our uh, business um, apprentices on a level three have just completed their qualification um, so most of our learners it, even if they were in college have gone online during lockdown and it hasn't disrupted any of the qualifications that our students were our apprentices have been working to and they've continued as, as um, college students along the way in terms of the question whether we deliver in-house Helen I guess what we're saying there is that we we host the obviously the apprenticeship but their day releases at various education providers in terms of the combination and yeah, what the report was highlighting was that well, the challenge has been obviously whilst people are working from home to make sure that particularly new apprentices are getting exposure to the relevant areas. So that did disrupt particularly one of our apprentices in a planning area. In fact, they've now moved into the policy area, which is much more easy for them to still get development on through effectively video Zoom. But equally, as we now return staff to the office, we're looking at returning some of the apprentices and their managers so that they can still have that daily catch up in the office, you know, at least once a week and therefore get that overview better. And, and particularly with planning, it's about going on to the site visits and supporting those visits as well. Because we have to provide 20% on the job. So even if they're not at college, they have to do that online. So, you know, we've been doing, um, I see they've still been having training, they've been having Zoom meetings, um, they've been attending meetings. So again, training doesn't have to be actually being in, a, in an educational environment. So we're quite creative. We get people to do some work shadowing, you know, come and sit in meetings like this. So we try and do as much as we can to give them as much exposure um, for them when they move on or actually, you know, hopefully we keep them and we can get more out of them later on. Any, any, any follow up, Councillor Demar? No, nope, that, that's fine. Yeah. Thank you very no, much that, indeed. That, that, that. Just one thing to note on that, because I would want you to be clear as, as the committee, is that we, we are having some difficulties in the apprenticeship area. Um, and actually, in particular, in planning, which, as members will recall, we've been wanting to take on as many planning apprentices as we can, pretty much, because of the need mm -hmm. to keep that pipeline flowing. Unfortunately, in their wisdom, the, the providers of the standards and frameworks have um, abolished the planning framework and there isn't a replacement available just yet. So yeah. it's had a quite a dent. We would have taken on some more planning apprentices in line with a September start. And unfortunately, we're not able to do that because there is no standard for them to go on. Um, it's, it's run joined, out, hasn't it? Yeah, it has a, it has a shelf life and it's run out and there hasn't been the, the next one's not ready to come into place yet. So it's and obviously with COVID that slowed it down a little bit as well. That's really disappointing, but it, it, it's reassuring to see there are so many apprentices and then we've got capacity to, to take on more on. Thank you. Um, yeah, this, this year we should have six, but currently with the, the apprentices progressing and completing um, we're down to two. And so LT are looking at how we can effectively take on four more because we've got a budget for six because we have to pay their wages. As you know, the, the levy is to fund their development, not their wages. Yeah. But we've, As an organisation, we've budgeted for six, but we've currently got two in play and we're obviously looking. And in fact, I've been catching up from a week's leave myself. There's some suggestions of new areas that we're going to look at. And um, obviously, we're keen to make sure we do address that, not because we want to spend the salary budget, to be clear, but because we recognise this is an important pipeline. So this isn't, oh, we've got a budget, let's use it. It's very much actually, if we don't do stuff now, it will cost us a year or two down the line when we've got no pipeline coming through. 
Yeah. I think, sorry, it should also be noted that the one of our apprentices is finishing and we're looking at ways to support him going on to his degree level as well. So, you know, we're looking at the next steps and continuing to, you know, develop them on. That's good to see. Thank you very much indeed. Any other comments? I, I'd just like to say thank you for the e-learning modules that have been made available for members. Of those, I felt found them very useful. Um, do you have any indications on uptake from members or not? Um, not recently, because I've just returned from two weeks of leave. So I know I've been I've been doing sort of little pushes with people. So um, um, there's definitely more people have been engaging because I've had more emails when people haven't been able to get in or they've forgotten their user word. That's so right. that is a positive. Right. But now I'm um, I'll be working on the reports um, by the end of the month because actually I'm going on leave okay. again next week. So it's school holidays. Um, um, so when I'm back, I'll um, I'll um, I'll get that sorted. But yeah, there's there's definitely a lot more engagement. And also, if I, don't if I forget... could add to that, I've got some figures on that because um, we so. took stock recently when you were on leave, Helen. Um, the the safeguarding training, which is the main one we've been focusing on yeah. at the safeguarding policy group, uh, it was around 30% of members that have done that. So I actually think that you need to know as a committee that the member uptake on the e-learning courses has been quite poor, particularly oh. as obviously members have had time to do them working from home, etc. Um, I, I know that Peter Boylan in particular is very disappointed by those results yeah. as the yeah. as the portfolio holder for safeguarding. Um, I've arranged a meeting now with Suzanne rutland Barsby and Democratic Services, who are, are, are the drivers of member training. It's not a HR function. We just offer our support, no. i.e. No. rolling out the courses. And um, myself and Councillor Cutting, who's the portfolio holder, obviously, for HR, yeah. are going to meet as a, effectively a five, along with Lorraine Blackburn as the scrutiny officer, to look at how we can improve the take-up of training full stop. Because the other frustration is, as you will know this as, as the HR committee, is you're approving policies, for example, a health and safety policy that says members will have an annual refresher. And then we've got members saying, why do I need to do this each year? So uh, the point is we can't have policies agreed at council, which indeed the health and safety was, that then aren't followed up. So we need to improve that join up. And I would, would be wrong for me not to highlight to you that it's an area of concern, but the plus is that we are trying to address it. Lovely, thank you. But thank you very much for providing the module because it, it's good that they're important that they're there. Thank you. Any other questions before we move on to noting this report? Right, we're just noting this report, aren't we, Will? Thank you very much. And on to the next agenda item. Um, and just that, that Helen's going to leave us now, so I'll just quickly oh, say yeah. thanks to Helen. Yes, Helen, thank you very <laughs> this much. This is a non-working day for work. Helen, but she wanted to join us on Zoom as she could. Oh, we're, we're pleased that you did. Thank you very much. Thank and you, um, enjoy your next holiday. <laughs> <laughs> thank, you. thank you. I'm not really going anywhere because of lockdown, but it's not work. <laughs> See you soon. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Helen. Um, right, our agenda... Number 12, the annual turnover report. Um, and who's talking to this one? Is this? It's me. Oh, is it you? It's Vicky, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Vicky. <laughs> um, is there anything you want to add before we move on to questions? Uh, no. <clears throat> right, comments, questions? Anyone? It's obviously such a Good report. No one's got any questions. Mm -hmm. Bye. -bye. Councillor Ruffles has, yeah. Chairman. Oh, I'm sorry, Councillor Ruffles. Yeah. It, um, Chairman, it's it's a very woolly question. I'm a bit ashamed of it, really. But um, the figure one, the annual turnover trends. Uh, everything about so much in this whole agenda is so good. It's uh, yeah. Broadly speaking, a success story with us looking at little bits that, you know, just we might want to straighten up. Um, and our 10.1% employee turnover strikes me as being particularly healthy, that figure, mm -hmm. as a layman, apart from what Simon might uh, say about it. Um, really, really good. But um, I just wonder on the reasons for leaving figure two. Um, Which page are you on there? Um, this is page, page 99. Yeah, I haven't got, uh, I'm afraid my East Hearts emails have failed yet again. That's all uh, right. We know where you are. It's page 99, and he, figure two is correct. It's 4.1 for anyone who's figure looking for two. it. Yeah, I've got you. Yeah. Right. Um, I just wonder whether there's any 
to me, that whole thing just looks so well spread and evenly balanced mm -hmm. that for an HR committee, uh, there's no particular focus that we ought to be concerned about and encourage officers to, to work on. But is that right? Is there a segment here that we really ought to be more concerned about than any other or is just that the spread ideal the number ideal and if, do we not it along? is vicky is responding it, to this simon or not could, could i go go first and then if vicky wants to add anything because me and vicky have actually discussed this between us okay and um, i just want to say that one thing we would like to reduce is the other factor because obviously it's just that it's another factor and there were a couple of people in the other that have actually left us for a promotion really but we, we, we left them where they were because they didn't sort of put that as the main reason. And just the other little comment I just want to stress, because it is in the paper, but it's worth stressing before Vicky adds anything more, is that obviously the size of us and the type of organisation that we are, you know, we're a 330 staff roughly organisation, um, much lower when you get into full-time equivalents. And being a local authority district council, we are often a stepping stone for people on their local authority journey. And, you know, and that is never going to change whatever we do. So, yes, the 10.1% is very impressive. But what I want to stress really is people leaving us promotion shows that their time here was well spent. And I don't see that as a negative. I'm not saying anyone does, but I think it's worth everyone recognising that it's actually a positive when someone leaves you promotion. Yes, it's a bit frustrating, yeah. but it shows their time was well served and that they're in that progression yeah. mode. And hopefully we rid a little bit of that higher quality level that they were achieving just before they went as well. And I'll, I'll let Vicky add anything more. The only thing I wanted to add is that we are, to say, Vicky. Um, we are um, trying to upscale, upskill um, staff to make sure that there is there are opportunities for them um, where we can. So that is something that you know we can do to, to help in that area. But they're really good statistics, I agree with Councillor Ruffell. Any other comments, questions before we move on? So we're noting that report as well, yeah. please. Yeah, no, right. You're right. This is a noted one, isn't it? That's one to be noted, That's isn't correct, it? Yeah. 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 Well, right. Uh, Thank Chairman, you. Uh, I think it's all very well noting these things and stopping us inquiring further i i, I, I don't think I've... Oh, it's, you're free to inquire further councillor ruffles if you've no, got a no, question earlier this evening a couple of us were told uh, it was inappropriate for us to question um and i find that too limiting quite frankly uh, and mm -hmm. I, I think we should be allowed just to clarify things we don't understand um and uh, which i would like to do if i may um there is in the exit questionnaire analysis uh, a number of bullet points and uh, one of them uh, that clearly we need to work on but i don't know how is the 65 percent that's 13 employees it's quite long down the list of bullet points yeah page 103 are, are, yeah are feeling that they may not have had that adequate training 65 percent are happy but others is the is the uh, a way of addressing that uh have we do we know what would have led uh the 35 percent one third to be unhappy about the training they received uh i just wonder whether that's a question and one other thing that uh, we were tried to ask about a little bit earlier and I haven't heard the answer to incidentally as the agenda has progressed was the reorganization restructuring of the planning department which seems to feature in several of these reports and I wonder and it's referred to as being imminent so could I add that question into this general one about training for staff um, with the uh, the current format of the exit questionnaire, um, it, it, we're unable to get, gather more information as to why um, leavers are reporting that they feel they've not had adequate training or coaching. One of our actions going forward is to look at the exit questionnaire format so that perhaps we can gather a bit more intelligence on that because I think it's really important um, to get that feedback. Um, 
And in terms of the planning um, restructure, um, I know that the head of planning is keen for that to move forward. Um, I think things have taken a bit of a, um, a knock because of um, COVID, um, but I'm the HR support for um, planning and I have a meeting with Sarah coming up this month. Sorry, Sarah's the head of planning. Um, and one of the items that we'll be talking about is, is how we move forward with um, the restructure. Just to reassure you, there are there is cover in place with agency staff. I know that's not ideal, but um, there is cover in place there. But hopefully, we'll be moving forward soon with that. In fact, I spoke to Sarah Saunders today. Um, she began initial meetings with staff before lockdown. As Vicky's highlighted, they were then paused because of the lockdown, because that face-to-face -face stuff, which is quite important when you're looking at structure and obviously getting staff on board with where we're going. And we're not looking at redundancies as a result of this restructure and that's partly the benefit of having agency staff covering it but you're right to raise it is obviously what we keep saying about why there's these vacancies on hold because of the imminent planning restructure and i i, I feel like you we need to get that done but obviously helen um, helen uh, sarah wanted to embed herself first she started at a similar time to me um but yeah she spoke to me today to say that that will be getting progressed we're actually looking as you can imagine and i think you're you're probably all aware we're looking at uh, all areas in relation to the losses of income in relation to COVID. So obviously every area is being looked at and the planning area is continuing to be looked at, but now with an extra pair of eyes in terms of, is there any opportunities for cost savings or further income being generated with the new structure? Do you wish to come back on anything, Councillor Ruffle? No, but it, it was striking that one of those areas that are so difficult to recruit, we weren't even trying, as it were, because of this imminent restructuring, which is, we've been waiting for for months. And that seems, it just in my simple terms, seemed to me to be the one that we should be fishing for, uh, in particular, because the, the numbers themselves are quite big and that we're short of, and, uh, and time is passing with a, an excuse that something will happen sometime to enable us to start. And so it's good news that we seem to be very much closer to the imminent as we, uh, at this meeting than we were yeah. before. I, I should just respond to that in particular on behalf of Sarah, because I understand the point that you're making, but I think we should stress that the workload of planning has been substantially increased in the last number of months prior to COVID, nothing to do with COVID. We've had various, as you will know, the old River Lane, inqu uh, River Lane inquiry. We've had the Little Haddam issues. Um, the, the work that's been going on, also the Hertfordshire Growth Board stuff, the Harlow and G Gilston Garden Town Project, they, they are very stretched. So... You know, the point that Vicky has made is there isn't any vacancies where, where no one's sitting in the chair, the chairs are filled, but what they want to do is actually structure the team better to work with themselves going forward, and that's particularly in relation to line management and then they, that works in the area. So I think we'll see improvements. It hasn't slowed down the work they're doing, but they have been slowed down by very large and quite a character increased workloads as a result of significant inquiries in recent months. Sorry, Councillor Newton. Thank you. Councillor Newton. Yes, thank you very much. Um, it was something that uh, Council Ruffles uh, brought forward, and this is the the exit survey, or however you do it. I remember at the very beginning of coming on board, how we spent a lot of time talking about how very important it is to know why somebody leaves, and then there, so therefore to be told that we currently have a survey that is not able to give us the information we want is a little disappointing. So by the time we come back to the next meeting, is it possible that we will have a survey that will give us information as to why people move on? Um, because I think it's so invaluable. And as for the planning of the uh, planning department, well, we knew all this hard work was coming. It was coming like a tsunami. So, you know, I think it's essential that if the team needs to be reconfigured, reconvened in a different format to deal with the volume of work. I mean, the volume is vast. I do know and I do appreciate what's been coming. As we knew it was coming, I think, as Councillor Ruffles said, it, you know, it, hopefully by the time we have the next meeting, 
we will have something re being reported on. Uh, that's my only wish. Anyway, yeah, well, I, I would be confident that we will by that point. Uh, it, uh, but I, I just got to stress again that you have got to recognise in planning there has been a change of, of head of service. Sarah has been with us now for just over a year. Uh, Kevin Steptoe, her predecessor who moved into the Garlo, sorry, Harlow and Gilston Garden Town project, um, had not, not that far before Sarah arrived, restructured the team. And some of this is actually about the new head of service getting the structure that she feels works better. But obviously that's involving all of the staff in that. Now, the good news is the staff discussions have been taking place for some time and staff are, and, and there's been various meetings. As I say, it was slowed and we have effectively had a three month slow as a relation to COVID. But I, I was just, coincidentally, I spoke to Sarah today about an unrelated matter and she took great joy in telling me how that was progressing again and she managed to pick that back up again. And I know they've had some socially distanced meetings outside as well amongst their managers. So, you know, things are moving again. Um, obviously, I, as, a, as the head of HR, I have to say that we can only support services to restructure when they're ready to do it. We can't push them along because obviously it must be owned by the service and the service then gets support from us with it. But I, I will pass on your comments that, they, that you wish to see the planning restructure progress. In terms of the exit questionnaires, I think that um, Vicky didn't quite say what, what I think you might have now received. We do know why people leave. We haven't got an additional question on why they don't feel the training is adequate. It's very easily addressed that. We will add a box under that question to say, if you feel it's inadequate, please explain why. And, and we'll see what response we get. You do also always have a portion of people leaving that are leaving because potentially they haven't been able to do the job that well themselves. Um, and therefore, they're not always going to be the most positive view of you in an exit questionnaire. If you've been telling them to improve and then they've decided to move on, they're not going to say your training was great. So you, you do have to recognise there'll always be a proportion of disgruntlement in an exit questionnaire. And I would actually uh, stress the members that a better form of information is a staff survey. And we will be running that again before the end of this calendar year. Um, on its three year cycle. And I think we should be looking closely at what people think about our training that are currently here, more so than when people are walking out the door. And that's certainly something we'll be progressing. We are improving the exit questionnaire for a number of reasons to add some additional questions. And Vicky's absolutely right to say that we can also look at getting some more clarity when people give us a negative response, asking them why. But I will warn you that a number of staff will leave that box blank regardless of us asking them to put a comment in. So we may still be coming back to you and saying we're not totally sure, but please don't shoot us because we are only the messenger on that one. Okay. No, appreciate Thank it, you. Simon. I appreciate Thank it. You. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments, questions? No. So we're moving to noting this report. Vicky, thank you very much for it. It was very comprehensive. And on to the next item now, which is, um, where are we? Item 15, Chair. We are. Yep, sorry. I'm trying to get my thing to move. Yep, item six, uh, 15, the standby and out of hours. Policy. No, no, we, we have just jumped to items. We're on item 13, I believe, the wellbeing yeah. report. Item oh, that was the annual report. Yes, I'm sorry, you're right. And this it's is Vicky's report as well, report. before we seek clarity. It's oh, Vicky, okay. the author. This is the Vicky patch of the meeting, to be clear. I will shut up. <laughs> <laughs> we'll believe that when we hear it. Right. Vicky, is there anything you want to add before we go to questions? I can see Councillor DeMont is keen to ask a question. No, nothing further no. to add. Thank you. No, Councillor DeMont. Hello, Vicky. Hello. Um, hello. Looking at page uh, number 118, when we're talking about how we address absence, uh, number five, and in particular 5.1, um, where it says it's hard to avoid um, short-term absences, and particularly, I guess, Fridays and Mondays are often, as an employer myself, days we see that. I've seen none of it in my people I employ in lockdown which has been quite interesting with all of these people that need all these days off here and there suddenly haven't in my business so i wonder if we're seeing the same in the council as well if you may not have statistics on that but just anecdotally or from what you've seen have we seen a drop off i think the question i'm asking is have we seen a drop off in in short-term casual sickness since march yes and um the quarter one um, quarterly report, um, you will see that six, sickness absence has dropped significantly, um, which we think is 
um, due to people perhaps, you know, where they're not feeling quite 100 percent because they can be in the comfort of their home. They can still work to some extent. So um, and also more flexibly as well. So, you know, they're still putting in in, in the hours, but perhaps, you know, flexing it a little bit if, if, if they're not too well. Um, so, yes, we've definitely seen a significant drop in in sickness absence for quarter one. So that's April to June. Um, thank you very much. I just wonder if this kind of flexible working, as hopefully co coronavirus and COVID-19 goes away over time, I wonder if these, this is where it says it, it, it's unavoidable. Maybe this does indicate an answer or, or a lesson we can learn from this situation, that being a bit more flexible with people, if they're well enough to work, but perhaps I don't want to jump in a jump in the car or on a on a bike to come to it. Maybe there's a maybe there's Yes, and I think um, as we know in any organisation, sometimes um, I mean, as you can see, um, stress is one of the causes of um, short term absence. So that could be anything to do with the stress of caring for others. And from the wellbeing survey, we found that people have been better able to do that whilst working from home. They've been better able to support their children. So I think on the whole, um, the flexible working is having lots of benefits. And I know that le the leadership team have had discussions and, and are continuing to have discussions about um, how we can support staff um, further in terms of flexible working um, to allow staff to work from home um, more frequently if that's appropriate for the job um, and it's even proven that um, some jobs that we thought couldn't be done from home can actually be done from home so um, it's been a big learning experience I think. We are very much working on a hybrid model going forward combining yeah. home working with office based working and that is the long term future that is our new normal as far as we are concerned at East Hearts we are not going to go yeah. back to a position of extensive office based working but we also recognize and i know this is felt by unison as well that there are benefits of being in the office those informal interactions those catch-ups and that, that lack of isolation etc also has merit so that's why we're looking very much at a hybrid of the yeah. two as opposed to one or t'other yeah and following on from that i see an item uh, 5.3 on page 118 it says that it's important managers recognize the signs of stress in an early stage so that action can, can be taken to support the employees. Now, that, that is obvious. Um, and I think much easier to recognise for managers when they're face to face with somebody in the office. So how are they picking up on, on any well-being needs remotely, as it were, virtually? Because that must be an issue for some people. It, it's very easy to hide illnesses, especially mental health illnesses um, over a screen. Absolutely. And, and managers should still be having regular one to ones with their members of staff, which um, we're, as HR officers, we're keeping an eye on. The um, wellbeing survey has identified where particular staff are struggling as well. And um, therefore, we've been working with managers to have further support conversations with those members of staff to make sure that they're supported. We've been doing lots of um, work within HR to promote um, well-being such as mental health awareness week at the end of May, the support that people can receive from mental health first aiders. We've partnered with Able Futures which supports staff on um, medium to long-term um, mental health um, support. So the, there are lots of things in place um, to, to support and people who are working remotely. And, and you're fairly, well, can anyone be confident that that is picking up everyone? I can see Councillor Alder and Councillor Newton when you speak, but um, do, 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 you, uh, I think do you think the managers... We, yeah. we can gain confidence in particular from the wellbeing survey because we had all of the normal measures in place and we moved very quickly to Zoom and everyone as a manager was told to carry on meeting people and they're doing it on Zoom. So you can still see someone's face. I know it's not quite the same, but when it's one-to-one, -one, you okay. can get quite a good sense on how someone's okay. doing. 
But to add to that, we did the full well-being survey, which meant if you weren't someone who was going to just tell your manager, you then had an opportunity to write it down and inform us. And then we had a follow up with you and everyone's been followed up. So Good. I don't think we, you know, it isn't always as easy. I think it is probably easier to see some nuances when you've got someone working alongside you. I wouldn't disagree. And we can yeah. probably never replicate that fully. But I think we've yeah. done as much as we can to to ensure. Okay. Also, as Vicky said, we've also highlighted other support for them. And we've been given support to them, for example, on if they suffered a bereavement during the lockdown. Now, that, that wasn't just COVID. That was about saying you're on your own at the moment. We want you to feel part of. There's mm -hmm. been um, some managers have been doing informal sessions. There's been some bingo sessions on Zoom going on. Um, there's been a, a chat group chat group created for people to engage with each other on on the internet. So, and of course, there's also been the the union support for people if want as well. I, I do feel the need to say that with Jackie nodding previously <laughs> at all of this, but but yeah. So there, there's 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 a number of channels. And of course, there's also the opportunity to come to HR if you if you want to raise an issue. Yeah. So I think there's plenty. What you've got Thank to do, you. haven't you, is keep the doors open and keep listening yeah. and encourage people to talk. And we've been doing all of that. Yeah. Thank you, um, Councillor Alder. I think you were first, and then Councillor Newton. Uh, thank you, Chairman. It, it's on the well-being um, issue because I think that we have developed a really good program for staff at East Hearts and I did notice that we were shortlisted as the finalists on the Reward and Employee Benefits Association for its wellbeing programme. I, I just wonder was there an outcome to that? <laughs> Yes, unfortunately, we didn't win. It is in the team. It is in my infamous report, the team and payroll update report. Um, we, we, yeah, we were shortlisted, which we shared with you at the last meeting in, in February, I think. But yeah, unfortunately, um, our, uh, we did have a couple of staff go to the awards too. Um, but uh, unfortunately, they came home with the sad news that we didn't win on this occasion. Um, I'll be honest to say that that is an industry wide award and um, there's always going to be a tendency to reward the people that are buying services from Reba and we don't buy any services from them. But to get shortlisted was a real achievement for us. And, I'm, I'm, you know, it's pleasing that we got that far. Shame we didn't win it, but it does show that the stuff we're doing, which was was wider than just the staff side. That's also our community well-being outreach side as well that was covered in that in that tender. Um, so it's good that it was recognised. And obviously, we'll keep looking for accreditation for the good work that we're doing where we can. Well done to the staff. I think it was it was terrific that you got to be in the final. So well done. Thank you. You're you're all winners to us, of course. Yeah. And chairman. We're biased. Chairman. Yes. I think we've got Captain Mont online. I think I just lost the video. Hopefully, you lost the video. Hear us. Can you hear us, Councillor Demond? Ah, oh, there he is. Did you just lose video or could you, did you lose? No, you went for a glass of wine. Volume? <laughs> oh, you went for water, I'm sure it's water. Um, <laughs> Councillor Newton, water, you had a question. <laughs> yes. It, that would it, be a big vod. Carissa, have some water. Yeah, some water. <laughs> um, it was, it's just, uh, I, I think you're doing an invaluable job actually, Simon. I'm very impressed. It's the sensitivities talking back about mental health and picking up if somebody is not functioning with the perpetual Zoom IT media. At what time or do you ever consider whether it might be appropriate when you have your one to ones to ask a person under social distancing and with all the health and safety that is involved, whether they could come in and just talk um, uh, as a one-to-one -one, uh, or do you always always at this moment in time do it through zoom i mean how do you read that sensitivity i.e an appraisal an appraisal is so important can you do that on zoom or would actually, you uh, really bring somebody uh, in the appraisal I mean, actually works quite well on zoom I, I, I appraised one of my staff fully on zoom and, and, it, and it did work yeah. well um but i think to the point to stress really is the options open to meet face to face because we've got the COVID secure workplace. Um, and, you know, I, as I as I hinted before, there are managers that have met up. There is a, a lot of use taking place at all fields of the bowling green um, and people going out there for, for uh, not bowling, um, but for yeah. meetings and for conversation. Um, there There is obviously the opportunity 
um, for those staff that are in the office to join in the Zoom meetings, but from a video room as well. So, so what I'm really trying to stress is because we've now got very clear clarity about numbers that we can accommodate in the office, individual desks allocated, all of the stuff we put in place, it makes it quite easy. And included in that is meeting rooms and the number that can comfortably be meeting there, the need to obviously wipe door handles. I won't bore you with it all, but the point is, there, when you say at what point, it's a judgment for the manager, but it's a tool available to them very clearly now, whereas it wasn't in the initial, with the hard restrictions that we had for those informal catch ups to take place. There's also, uh, sorry, or those meetings to take place. There also, Jackie's just prompted me, um, there are also informal meetups with some staff uh, where they're meeting as a team to support each other, because obviously there's also colleague support as well as manager support. Yeah. Um, Good. And of course, as I keep stressing, they've got other people they can ring and talk to if they need to. It's not yeah. just the line manager, but we should never uh, not not recognise the, the key role the line manager can play in terms of keeping that support available to their staff. Lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Fan meeting, anyone wants to say? When there's some excellent initiatives, I, I think it's... I think it's really good what you're doing. Thank you very much. Right, we've got no other comments. We'll note that report. Thank you very much, Vicky. I'm sorry I tried to skip it. Very important. Mm -hmm. um, on to moving on to agenda item number 14 now. Whose is this? Is this it's Vicky me again? again. <laughs> it's me again. In your section. Excellent. <laughs> right. Anything to add before we move to questions? No. Nope. Right, any questions, comments, points of clarification from anyone? Wow. Nope, such a good report. Although everyone's busy looking up their notes now on it, I think. Just, could I just make a couple of highlights? Um, because Vicky's do. already alluded to some of them. Um, you, you will obviously see that the uh, the turnover on uh, section 3.2, page 127, um, the prediction of the annual turnover has dropped massively. Um, I think yeah. that won't sustain. So I'd like to share that with members that obviously people aren't keen to leave an organization in a lockdown restriction process, because hopefully they all see it as we're all in this together. And that's why they're, they're not gonna rush out the door, if you see what I mean, unless they've already got irons in the fire. Um, so you'll see the turnover has dropped to be estimated at 4.8%. I, I would be very surprised if that sustains. So I don't want you to get too excited by that. And also we, we, we also, I think, recognise as a committee that turnover is healthy. It's not unhealthy. So, um, you know, we must recognise that. Equally, with regards to the sickness absence levels, you'll see that they've dropped to 1.8 days. You know, we just had a massive achievement last year to reduce down to five days. That was quite phenomenal in itself to get down from already a very uh, under under average figure of 6.5 days. Sorry, yeah, 6.5 days the year before. So we've gone from 6.5 to five. I'd be very happy if we managed to achieve anything between five and six and a half. I do not want you to expect a 1.8 day outcome, but at the moment, which obviously fits in with what Councillor DeMont raised, the reduction that we've seen during lockdown has had a, a good achievement for quarter one but um, we will probably not see that sustained. We have also, as an organisation, not had really any significant number of cases of COVID. So that potentially is all still to come. I'm not suggesting I want it to come when I say that, but you know, we, we haven't had those impacts either. So all I'm saying is we're very good, very good quarter one. I would expect it to return to more normal levels as we progress through the year. Would you agree with that, Vicky? Yes. Thank you. Any other comments? Anyone want to say anything else? We can move to noting that report. Thank you very much, Vicky. Um, three big reports there from you. Thank you. I really appreciate all your hard work. Are you done now or are you staying with us? I'm happy to stay or happy to go. I don't mind. You've got one more paper, Vicky, so you're definitely staying. Okay. You should Have stay I? then. Yeah, well, well, I'm assuming you're doing one of the policies, aren't you? And I'm doing the one for Claire. Oh, I can do. I can well, do, yes. We'll do it together, I'm but if to. you would stay for now, Vicky. Yeah. Of course. OK. <laughs> so having, so having noted that, we're moving on to agenda item number 15, um, which is the updated standby and out-of-hours policy. 
Yeah, I, I'll, I'll take different? that one. This is um, Claire worked on this paper and then we've got a general leave policy coming up, which Vicky contributed to, which is why I thought she would take that paper, but we'll, we'll get there in a moment. Um, so the out of hours policy has obviously been to local joint panel. Um, it's been approved by local joint panel. The, the, the policy uh, amendments are essentially to take out of the policy, the uh, separate out of hours team that existed a leadership team made a decision for that scheme to come to an end and for those staff to be given notice, which obviously we've we've gone through local joint panel on. Uh, the, the fundamental issue here is to do with the policy and the updating of the policy. So LJP have approved that um, and, and obviously we sent it to all of you uh, members as well um, to take on any of your comments at the LJP meeting if we could, meaning that we don't hopefully then have to go back to LJP should you change it. That's a big hint for everyone there. But um, the reality is we, we've so we've all seen this policy. Um, the fundamental change is taking out of the out of hours system that we had in place for general inquiries and putting in clearly the caretakers out of our service, which wasn't previously covered in the policy. So that's been the significant changes to this policy. Thank you. Uh, as you say, every, everyone had sight of this before it went to LJP. Um, uh, the opportunity to put in questions and at that point, but they still can now. Councillor Ruffles. Certainly don't want to try and railroad uh, the progress yes. of this, uh, and uh, I'm very pleased that it's been uh, agreed across the LJP people twice. The, the one little bit that um, I remain nervous about, though, um, is in the paragraph 3.6, the table there, just in the most recent years, shows six traveller matters. Um, and historically, but further back than this table suggests, East Hearts Council has been in very deep waters, because of out of hours, travel camps arriving and that sort of thing. And so with the, the caretakers on standby duty and then the out of hours call in of senior officers, I believe there's a very specialist function, isn't there a legal function that has to be physically performed um, on a traveler camp site? Yeah. Are we sure that we, um, have sufficient staff, legal staff, if I'm not mistaken, available to do that particular function. Okay, I think that the, there's some clarity to be provided before I fully answer that question, just to ensure we're all uh, we're all clear. The out of hours service was to take the inquiry uh, and then pass the inquiry on to yeah. a member of staff the next day. It's being replaced with an email address, so that there's nothing stopping that inquiry still being made. More fundamentally in relation to travellers, travellers aren't covered by this service, although they may have had six inquiries from members of the public the raising concern about travellers. Fundamentally, um, we have an out-of-hours service that still runs, which is our CCTV service based in Stevenage. So, and then every week, and I'm on it this week, so hopefully it's going to be a quiet week, uh, a member of a leadership team takes on the out-of-hours function. And as I say, that's me this week. And if there's a traveller issue, it's me dealing with it. And in terms of me having the legal expertise and support behind me, that's all in place. The legal team, you know, we have all the standard letters. We now use a particular service to help us with the travellers. In fact, during lockdown, if members are interested, I, I, I dealt with a travel issue on two occasions and, and I wasn't even on out of hours. It's just because I live nearby um, and we have managed to resolve that in the end. But the, the so the point being is the traveller concerns, if there are any, have not changed. They, they are well managed and they are fundamentally managed by the leadership team out of hours and managed by the um, housing and health service in hours. And then the housing and health service also uh, will send out enforcement uh, outside of hours where requirements are, are required. So it, 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 there's been no diminish, diminishment of that provision. It's purely that rather than paying people to be available all day long to answer a phone call that only ever led to them taking a message and passing it on to someone the next day. We've, we've needed to make savings and that saving has been made. But it will not affect the service provision in relation to travellers. Um, yes, there may be other areas where it would have still been preferable to have a human being, but the cost value was not beneficial. Okay. Thank you. 
you. Any other questions? Oh, um, yeah, again, Councillor Ruffle. Oh, you've gone off mute. You've gone on to mute, rather. We can't hear you. No, um, yep, there we are. tiny point in Appendix A, these things have a, a, a likelihood of being perpetuated. In the policy statement, 2.2, there's a funny hours typo thing. Thursday and Friday, we've got 10 o'clock instead of... Uh, haven't we? Yeah, 10 in yeah, the morning. Yeah, no, I can see so, that. Rather than 10 at night. Uh, just so that doesn't have an extended life. I'm oh, sorry, I was, I was reflecting on why that why that would be different, but you're absolutely right. If it's an out-of-hour service, then there's people in work at 10 a.m. So, yes, we'll get that adjusted. Thank you for highlighting it, Councillor Ruffles. And we won't need to go back to OJP to get that changed. I can reassure <laughs> everyone on that. <laughs> okay. So, thank That's you well so much. Spot well spotted, yeah. Well, anything else? No. So, for this, we need to approve the changes. Is that right? Yeah. So... <laughs> Do we do we need an approve um, a proposer and a seconder? Correct. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, Councillor Newton, I saw you put your hand up. Are you proposing? Thank you. Uh, seconder, Councillor Alder. Thank you. Um, all in favour, please raise your hands. And that's carried unanimously. Thank you very much. And then we're on to the next one. Sorry, my computer's running slowly. Um, this is the um, agenda item 16, the general leave policy. So, um, Vicky, did you doing this one? Yes, yeah, sure. Happy to take this. Um, so, the general leave policy was updated in line with a um, change in legislation regarding statutory parental bereavement leave, um, which came into effect in April um, 2020. Um, that provided for two weeks um, bereavement leave um, paid at a statutory rate. However, because the council already offers bereavement pay for the first week at full pay. Um, that was the initial um, proposal. Through um, consultation with Unison, um, they proposed that um, the second week was also made, um, was also paid at full pay, and this was agreed at local joint panel. Sorry, um, Vicky wasn't at local joint panel, and the, oh, do you, you know the other bit that was agreed, do you, Vicky? I just want to make sure. Yes, I'm yes, just sorry. moving on to oh, the, the, yeah, the next bit. Yeah, that's okay. Um, and when the policy was taken to local joint panel, um, it was also proposed that the the 26 weeks continuous service that was needed to qualify for the pay element of, of bereavement um, should be removed. So it's a, a day one um, uh, support for staff. Thank you. Any questions, comments, points of clarification? And again, we obviously saw this before it went, but uh, we're still entitled to make any comments or observations you wish. Anything? No, no, no. Right. Um, so we have got um, A, B, and C. Can we, can we take these as one, or do we have to do them separately? Well. If members are happy to take it as one, you can just take it as a block, yeah. You take it as one, right. Could we have a proposer, please? Councillor Alder proposing and the seconder, please. Councillor McMullen, thank you. All those in favour of approving all of these on block? I think that's unanimous, carried unanimously. Thank you, everyone. Um, next item. So, um, are you done now, Vicky? Are you staying with us or are you um, I'll you're stay. leaving? You're very welcome to stay. Thank you. 
Um, so this is a last item, 17, which is the HR and payroll team update. This is a big document with an awful lot in it. I mean, I'm hugely impressed by this report. There's just so much, so many good things going on within our council. And we're really lucky. Um, Simon, you're talking to it, are you? Yeah, no, thank you for those comments. I do apologise for the length of it, but obviously you've no. got a six month period. So mm -hmm. that is also why it is longer than you might be expecting. Um, yeah, obviously there is a lot to highlight. Um, I'm, I'm just going to skim myself. Uh, learning and development, I think we've covered enough in the annual reports. The, the, probably the main fundamental area to update you on is the HR update section four. That's where we talk about the East Hearts Together development update. Um, and what, what I wanted to highlight there is obviously in section 4.11, it sets out where we feel we are now as an organization and where we want to get to. So that's very much in line with the terms of reference that Councillor Alder was referring to. So that's where we feel we are and that's where we feel we, we need to get to. We then identified a number of quick wins, which I talked about uh, earlier in the meeting to do with the Outlook calendar protocols, getting photos on, having a corporate email signature. That's all started to bed in fully now. Um, which is positive. Uh, we've also achieved a customer uh, uh, charter that has been adopted by a leadership team and is being implemented in due course. So we've now got a new customer charter that's for the residents, uh, but there also will be internal customer standards. And in fact, myself and Vicky are going to be working on some service standards for HR, which we will effectively refer to as our customer service standards. Um, and we will obviously share that with the HR committee once they're developed. And then that will give us a tool to survey our managers um, to ask if we're achieving the standards that we say we're going to achieve because fundamentally HR is there to support managers to manage their staff. Um, we have also agreed terms of reference for all of the employment policies in terms of ensuring that the policies are joined up, they have good examples uh, in them and in particular we're looking at flow charts being more implemented in the policies but fundamentally the big change with the policy is not only are we going to be improving the content and making sure they're more best practice than they are currently that doesn't mean they're poor currently it just means we want to get them better but equally we're, we're going to be working with effectively service managers and members of staff um, and we've got a group for that so that they can actually say how do you find this policy is it a useful tool would you prefer there to be some flow charts if so what could that look like so that they get better owned and better used and better understood really so I think that would be a real positive and obviously we'll Jackie as I say is part of that group but we will, that will still involve the normal process of policy development the big addition is that the East Hearts Together group will be a starting point it will then progress to LT it will then go to Unison, it will then go back to LT, it will then come to LJP, and then it will finally get to you guys. So that's that's going to be the process. It is a long process. I haven't really added any layers there. It's just that we've got some greater input in from a wider in range November. than just HR. We get Sorry? it in November. We get it in November by the look of it, do we? Yeah, so we're, we're then having to count back from every meeting to work out which ones we can get into that flow. And obviously it is subject to LT getting it moved through their process first as well. But, but that's looking positive and we've developed a, a plan and we've allocated, in fact, a number of the policies have been redrafted, but we're just beginning that East Hearts Together part of the process. So HR have worked on a number already. Um, you will also see that uh, in addition to, to the policy stuff, there's lots of work to get, as I say, more effective use of tools like Zoom, like email. Um, obviously something we have seen during lockdown is an increase in emails. And we want to cut them down again because they, as you all know, can become quite a chore keeping your housekeeping on your emails fundamentally. So um, we're looking at the email logic training that we bought in previously being rolled out again because Helen Farrell is an email logic trainer, which basically means you do things like turn off the alerts on your email so you don't spend all day responding and you go to it when you want to. I won't try and do the training course here, but it's some good etiquette. We can share some of that with members as well if you're interested once that's out there again and we're just revising that. And we will be developing a HR and OD strategy and that will come to the next HR committee meeting. It's for obviously HR committee to agree and adopt that strategy. It's not a policy, it's a HR committee function to do that. Um, I'm working on a draft of that, which will obviously, I will consult the East Hearts Together group first and then leadership team, and then it will come to you and HR committee to um, consider and uh, amend and approve as you see fit. Um, 
The, the other fundamental covered in the HR section is that we've added in the Indeed provision. In particular, Vicky's been quite key in the development of that and has been spending time working on the company pages that we talk about in the report. So that will be an improved thing. And then we've also built into the new starter process that when people come in and join us, they'll be asked to put a review on the Indeed site as part of their new starter journey, which will mean we'll get a good number of reviews on there. Hopefully they'll be positive, otherwise they probably wouldn't have joined us, but we'll build up that sort of presence online, which will be really helpful. Um, and then the other area to mention in the HR update is the fact that we have delivered services to Datchworth in this period, and they've been very pleased. Obviously we're very grateful with their letter. Um, Obviously, a lot of this is to do with the success that we have had with Hartford Town Council, and indeed, it's um, it's their town clerk that's been keen to promote our services to other organisations, and that's why we're Town Council have approached us as well. Um, but we're, rather than previously saying we want to develop all our policies a bit more first, we're now taking that work on, and obviously, we need to generate more income as a council. So HR are taking are, are playing a part in that, and we've looked at our products. Um, it does mean that we've got to have a conversation with part for town council about our prices because they're, they're working on 10 year old prices at the moment. I do hasten to, to warn the three members of the heart for town council. That is something we will be progressing on to, but maybe you can let me get on to Joseph first in the first instance there. Um, the uh, wellbeing support is, is section six in the report. And, you know, I would particularly like to thank Vicky, which I do do in the report, but I'm glad she stayed for the rest of the meeting because the work that Vicky in particular put into the development of the survey, but then the phenomenal report that she produced afterwards with all the analysis, um, leadership team are incredibly grateful. And obviously as the head of service, I'm incredibly grateful that I've got an officer that can produce that quality of work. So I would like to thank her for that. Um, and she's given me the stern look, which I'm not sure is, I wish you hadn't done that or not, but I'll, I'll keep moving on. Um, so, um, as are shown in this in this paper, are that 93% of our employees rated us as six or higher out of 10 in terms of their overall experience of working from home. Uh, indeed, that meant that there were 20 staff that weren't finding it so positive. And actually of that 20, 11 of them had actually rated us five out of 10, which you could argue is saying it's okay anyway. But the key point there is, as I've already stressed, is everyone has had a follow-up, but in particular people that weren't finding it so positive have had a really extensive follow-up. And some staff have now returned to the office in, in terms of supporting that that difficulty that they were having at home. It's for a combination of reasons. Obviously the IT and the equipment reasons were more easy to address, but if there was actually an environmental issue, what I mean by that is the home environment was too noisy. We've got, for example, a married couple at the workplace that they could not work in the same environment. You know, it just didn't work with the kids. So we've been looking at how we can accommodate them to come back into Wallfields. But actually, we've also looked at, although we're not reopening Charrington's, we are reopening the launch pad at Charrington that's been reopened. And therefore, we can allocate them a desk to work in that environment in Bishop Stortford, as opposed to working from home or asking them to travel all the way to Hartford when they're, when they're normally based in Charrington's, for example. So yeah, that's been really pleasing. It's been good the way the staff really responded well to that survey as well. We've given them the highlights at our staff briefings. Um, and then just those final little bits to say, obviously we've also kept the mental health first aiders going. And that again is particular credit to Vicky. If you haven't picked up, Vicky leads on wellbeing for us as a team. So that's why um, Vicky has been particularly key in all of that. And we are in the stage now of buying some more flu jabs um, obviously, we did reflect on whether um, that would be the right thing to do with COVID, but we feel that it, we should still be supporting people with other ailments. And there is obviously a flu vaccine, which we had 70 staff take up last year. So we're, we're looking at purchasing a similar number. Um, and um, obviously, we now have the results from the wellbeing um, annual report that our sickness absence has dropped. And therefore, there is justification, for want of a better phrase, in investing in those flu jabs because we have seen a drop in short term absence. Um, and therefore, there is you can play some link to that. In the previous year, we hadn't seen a drop. So it's pleasing to see that we have now in our short term absence levels. Um, we continue to have frustrations with the HR and payroll system. We've now got our new account manager. Um, he, he seems to take a month to respond to our first email, so it is still a problem for us. We are, at, though, increasing our work with IT 
and there is some discussion around the the product moving to be hosted by the provider which will certainly mean that the updating of the system and some of the difficulties that we've had with our own IT department at times would, would diminish, but there will be cost implications. So that's obviously for both authorities, because you're probably aware we, we have a shared IT service from Stevenage, um, but we also both bought the product together. So whatever we decide to do with the product needs to work for both organizations. So that, that was a whistle stop tour, but obviously I particularly wanted to highlight the, the HR work that had been, been undertaken because that isn't so well covered in some of the other reports. That's not underplaying the huge work. And I was really grateful that you thanked Peter that, that has been involved for health and safety during this period. Uh, Peter's really enjoyed, I think, the uplift in his status and importance, um, but he has thrived in it. Um, and you know, we, we particularly have to also thank, because I know Peter would want to do it and I know I've done it once already but it is worth doing twice and she knows it's coming is Jackie and her involvement in the turnaround of those risk assessments because you know we take some time to develop them and but then Unison have turned them around in a couple of days with feedback and then we've had them implemented because no one was being allowed to do the work until the risk assessment was in place so it's really important that we did work well together on that and got that turned around. Wow oh, thank you. Jackie, you need to come more often. You would never get complimented this much normally, I expect. <laughs> Thank you for all your hard work. Uh, and Vicky, you're, you're a star as well, obviously. You know, it's nice to get such praise from your line manager. Have we got any questions, comments, points of clarification, anything about this report? It's a long one. Councillor Russell, please. Well, I think I'm uh, excited by it. It's certainly a really upbeat and thorough a report and something that we can be pleased about. I think many authorities, uh, considering their position at this stage, may not be nearly as um, capable of being excited, I think, and upbeat about the, the work that's going on in HR department here. Um, but having, having said that, um, and I'm not wanting to take the shine off it at all, but this is um, a public agenda paper, and it reads to me much more like something that Councillor Joe Dumont would understand readily, professionally, uh, and the rest of us probably have had a bit of a struggle with uh, the cryptics and, uh, and the lack of a glossary at the end. It's very tightly written. And so I'm thinking of the person who's, um, looking at YouTube tonight, for example, and watching us, you know, looking at this report to the member of public, uh, it reads like a good in-house report in a way and isn't nearly as accessible to, um, for others. Or, you know, that phantom reader in the, the public library who goes in and thinks they'd like to find out what HR department is doing, will look at the latest agenda. I think they'll have quite a challenge here um, to understand simple things like you know values are not fully embedded and no clear behavioral competences are behind them you know it's 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 language we are beginning to understand professionals easily understand it but it's uh, this document in the public realm that i think you know we ought to just hang on a little bit more uh, and keep more clearly in our mind uh, when when writing it, uh, I was I was really ready for a glossary, and there are lots and lots of things I kept congratulating myself on. Oh, I think I can I decode that, and I think I can decode this, but I, I don't think that should have been quite necessary. But I'm not really having a carp. Um, the whole report is one which we can uh, be proud of. I think um, through the work of. The staff that have created it and made it possible at this stage to analyze where we've been and to see a path forward to help us to develop as an authority so yeah i'd, I'd be happy to move whatever needs moving um to and to thank uh, simon particularly for the report well yeah I, I wrote the team update but the attachment is very much the report i was referring to that vicky produced off the back of the well-being survey um the but the comments you're making really relate to my report so i will respond to say that we will look at putting things in brackets i'm not going to promise you a glossary 
Um, but I will certainly look at putting things in brackets afterwards to reiterate the point. Yeah. I was obviously also conscious of the length of the report. Um, and what I have definitely taken on board, and I know my team has, is we don't use acronyms. We do always explain them fully in the first place. But I know that's not what you were saying just then. You know, it was referring to some of the, if I could call it maybe jargon, like, for example, yeah. competency. Yeah. Um, yes, I guess it's harder when you are living and breathing that area of work to recognise always where someone might need explanation. But we will keep trying on that. And um, I'm more than happy for you to give me any reflections on email where you think a further explanation might have been helpful going forward. So I get a sense of where maybe we need to do that more. That that would be helpful if you're if you're able to do that, Peter. But um, I'm glad that most of you managed to understand it all. And obviously, if there's any clarity I can provide, I'm happy to do that. Thank you. Um, uh, Councillor Alder. Uh, th thank you, Chairman. Uh, it, it's just a minor point, but um, I have to say it would be helpful if the um, uh, um, explanation on, vo on um, ex um, what do you call it, people's answer phones were up to date. So often it's three months out of date. Um, and if you're a member of the public and you want to get through to somebody, then you get this thing, well, it's um, it's March the 10th today and, uh, you know, and we're August. Um, it, if we could just remind staff that it might be, uh, it's on the it is appropriate that they do update their um, uh, answer, uh, answer phone message. Yeah. No, yeah, I'm not saying this because she's can. here, but Jackie is the East Hearts Together member leading on getting a, a more consistent voicemail approach across all staff, which actually includes all staff having voicemail set up. But I, I will also not pretend to you that there's been some issues with the IT provision in terms of everyone having voicemail. I don't have the voicemail on my phone currently. Um, I did once, it disappeared, I haven't been able to get it back. So um, I'm just going to say there's some technical issues, but your point about staff should have an up-to-date voicemail message if they have voicemail is completely accepted, completely agreed, and we are very much working on that basis. Thank and you. I, I, you know, I would expect any manager to take umbrage or issue whatever phrase you wish to use with a member of staff that has not got an up-to-date voicemail. You know, just like you're supposed to ensure you're out of office is on an email. It's all about communication. It's about managing expectations and obviously not causing unnecessary stress for people because you've got out-of-date information available. Thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Anything else? So it's we are this just, report is just very quickly. Yes. Oh, did you not? I've gone a bit dark. I'm aware of that. Yeah. But, uh, <laughs> I think have, the having a house full of four that. children. <laughs> a house full of four children and animals. My my meetings are out in the garden. Um, there's so much talk about in this, um, but um, thankfully you you be thankful that I won't. But I just think only because Simon mentioned it, um, to the extent that we can encourage people. Um, to take up the flu vaccine, so I think that's very important where we can. Um, and I think there's two, two benefits. Uh, one, uh, in what could potentially be short term track and trace reductions as well. And I'm, I'm to, again, professionally, lots of organisations are doing this because they don't want people catching flu and it being confused and, and there being short-term reductions so i think i, I don't you're, know you're the extent to what bit, can and, we can't encourage their staff to do that but Joe, I think you're breaking up a bit sorry oh did you did, did you get that where did you get to well I, i'm sure what i'm saying is i think it's a very sensible proposal that that, that, that should be followed through we, can, we can, I, can hear you i'm just losing every sort of third or fourth word we can just about hear you but it's a bit yeah, I think what I grasped there, and I'll maybe if I reflect, because it's obviously an action for me to sort of follow to an extent, is that Councillor Demont was supportive of us rolling out flu jab vouchers and yeah. thought there were additional benefits this year, yeah. in particular in relation to track and trace, of actually supporting staff and encouraging them to have those flu jabs. That's that's what I heard. Okay, yeah. you've given me yeah. a thumbs up. And, and would those be available to all staff if they want them? Oh, yes, yes. The, yeah, we, we only, we, we the number that I refer to is based on take-up. But the, the point that I think Vicky would possibly jump in and, and tell me, uh, she's about to, is that this is the natural, go on Vicky. 
Go for it, Kate. Get in quickly before we talk. <laughs> so, um, yes, it will be available to all staff. Um, the key change this year is that, um, so in previous years, um, those with underlying health conditions would get one for free from their GP. Yeah. Um, this year, they've added the over 51 um, category, so they can also get a free flu jab. So we'll just need to be um, clear in our um, communications when we roll this out, not that we'd be preventing people who are over the age of 51 um, from getting a voucher through the Boots scheme. We will just be making it clear that they can get it free from their um, GP. So um, we'll initially start with the um, 60 vouchers and then the same as what we did last year, where there's um, demand over that, then we'll, we'll look at purchasing um, additional vouchers. Yeah, believe it or not, we've actually had um, some members of staff saying, oh, when are you doing the flu jab vouchers? Um, I get one free, but it's just much more convenient when you give me the boots one. So um, it's amazing what some staff will respond to. And obviously what we're stressing there is there's an expectation because there was an age bracket previously. I think it was 60 or 65. I'm not, I don't recall. That's been lowered to 51 is the point that Vicky was making. So we're expecting there to be less of an uptake overall because staff will be able to access a free provision for themselves. And hopefully most staff would take on board that actually uh, the council paying for one when we don't need to is not really best use of our resources, nor their future and the longevity at the council. But we'll, we'll see how it goes. Thank you. Any other questions? Any, any other comments before we... So this, this report is to be noted. So it seems rather inadequate given all the hard amount of hard work and effort that's gone in. Um, so that's noted. A big thank you to all of the HR team, and I know you are really working as a team, so even the ones who aren't here, thank you very much for all your hard work. And I think we're done, aren't we? Yeah. It's 8.50, 2050. Thank you very much for your time, everyone. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Bye, then. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye.